and welcome to the third episode of season three of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 29th of March 2011 and in this episode we're going to talk about whether certain software needs to come with adults only warning and find out what we think about the next Ubuntu release, Nati Nawa. We will of course cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, command line love and go over your feedback. I'm Laura and with me this week are Laura. Hello, how are you? Hello, and what have you been doing this week? Um, I've upgraded to Natty this week, or upgraded to Unity. So um, it's been an interesting long week following bugs. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, well, we'll see how it goes. I'll give it another week or so and we'll see how it goes. Cool. And thank you for joining us again, because Mark isn't here this week. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Alan. This is going to get too confusing. <laughs> yes, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> no, not you. That one. And what have you been doing this week? Uh, I Yeah, I've been filing bugs as well, actually. Not, on Natty. On Natty. Now yes, I've got um, my desktop and my laptop are both running Natty. And um, yeah, I keep getting crashy things and stuff not working quite as it should. You said something okay. in the week about one bug leading to another bug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, something crashed. And I thought, right, I'll, I'll file a bug. I'll take a couple of minutes and file a bug. And as I started filing a bug, something that I needed, like Firefox or whatever, crashed while I was trying to file that bug. And then I thought, well, I'll file that as a bug as well. And then whatever process that gathered the stuff to file that bug crashed. And I was like, no! So, so large bad developers really like you right now. Absolutely, yes. And yeah, sounds lot, like you're liking them at the minute. Yeah. Well, a lot <laughs> of them are duplicates, luckily. So that's good. Other people have filed it as well. So, Cool. Excellent. And Tony, yes. what have you been doing this week? Well, I've been trying and failing to encrypt a hard disk, so if anybody can provide me with an easy way of doing that so that we can do an off-site backup thing, that would be handy. Um, playing with an Android phone that Alan has lent me, and uh, I went on a photo trip with Graham Binns. Cool. And so, yes, I got really intellectual, and I played cheese or font. What on earth is cheese or font? <laughs> pretty much what it says it's a website and it displays the name of a cheese or a font underneath has a button saying cheese and a button saying font <laughs> and there are about 250 of these in the database and you can go through for as long as you can stomach stomach it and for each one you got cheese or font and i think i got 55 percent on about 50 it's not easy but obviously there are some obvious ones like you know wensleydale and helvetica and stuff like that and yeah, probably. I didn't get to them. <laughs> <laughs> they were all just really hard. A lot of it was guessing. As you can tell, 55%. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, Tony's just finished answering the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a live show, everyone. So in which case, can I just say um, a little bit more? I had a really good photo trip with Graham Bins, the Launchpad developer, who, uh, who we've interviewed in, on the show in the past. We went up north and we did some photography for a few days, and it was great fun. And uh, thank you to Graham for organising all and sorting out all the practicalities. Excellent. <laughs> Hopefully there's no more interruptions now. The phone will go off in five minutes. You watch. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been playing with one of my phones? I have been playing with one of your phones, yes. Um that you had in a drawer and said you didn't want anymore. Well, it's Android. Why would I want that? Exactly. Um, <laughs> so that said, you gave it to me, and it's been on charge pretty much constantly since to uh, just keep it going. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting playing with these uh, new modern fangled pieces of technology. Have you made any phone calls on it? Uh, yeah, a couple. A couple. That bit seems to work okay. And okay. to be honest, most of the kind of application fangled angle stuff seems to work all right. It's, <laughs> it's pretty so retro. <laughs> It's pretty slow at doing text messages, like um, actually just loading the screen, your inbox or whatever they call it, you know, which mm -hmm. shows you all your messages you've got queued up. That's pretty slow. But um, yeah, other than that, it's all right, I suppose. How is the actual battery life? Um, depending on what you're doing with it, but I get a couple of days out of it. And that's about it's not it. bad. Well, apparently that's quite, you know, the standard for a smartphone is charge it every evening or whatever. But, you know, I'm used to a phone that lasts three or four days <laughs> yeah. without a charge. Yes. Yeah, but that's just me. Right. Sorry, I missed a bit of that conversation. Has everybody said everything that they need we, to say? We were yeah, talking. we talked about cheese, cheese, or, or, cheese font. or font. Oh, right, okay. I didn't miss anything too important. <laughs> right, well, we better get on with it then. Yes. I think so. <laughs> Honestly, I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, uh, prove I it. clearly don't. Um, <clears throat> there's been a couple of bugs filed recently, um, and um, <laughs> well, not surprising. And um, one of them is about uh, the maturity ratings, or 
um, whether there should be maturity ratings for um, for software because mm. people have done a search for applications and found stuff that possibly they might not want to show, I don't know, a child or um, someone at work or someone of a particular religious background. This was in the new Unity interface where the search result is in big letters on the middle of the screen. <laughs> yeah, someone searched for the word unattended to look at unattended backups. And there's a an app called Porn View, which happens to have an unattended mode. So the keyword unattended found an app that was probably inappropriate for that environment at the time. Well, it's, it's worth saying that the actual application is just a graphics viewer. It is. It doesn't have any inherently inappropriate content in it, it's other than if name. you quibble with the name. Yeah, sure. So it's not that you know, Ubuntu is suddenly shipping you know inappropriate images. No, we've done. We've been there. We've done that. But yeah, it's just an application with a slightly sort of you know inappropriate name, perhaps. Yes, and it's tricky because you know some people would say, well, we're all about freedom, and you should you know you should be able to just show whatever. But we're also about trying to be appeal to an awful lot of people around the world, and some of those people don't appreciate this kind of stuff in their face. Yeah, and there are other people who are picking up on the fact that there's a Bible package of some sort as well, which could be inappropriate in. Certain circumstances. Certain circumstances. <laughs> they <Yeah>. were saying. <laughs> nicely, yeah. nicely, uh, nicely done there, Tony. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you're in uh, a devoutly religious country where, you know, everything is all about one particular religious sect, then you know, then it may be inappropriate to display lots of imagery of another uh, religious group. So, where where does the bo- the line come between what is just freedom and allowing people to package software and put it in and call it anything? you know, they want to uh, in Ubuntu or, and where does it come saying actually we've got to make a commercially acceptable distribution, a culturally acceptable distribution and, um, you know, therefore it should be as unoffensive or inoffensive as possible. So what is it that MPT is proposing in this blueprint? That in, I guess it's in response to those books. So yeah, um, Matthew Paul Thomas, who works on the design team at Canonical, has started a blueprint which is the start of the discussion process for implementing something that fixes this potential problem and um, he's talking about uh, having a rating system now we already have ratings and reviews for applications but only like a one to five stars and Mm. you know whether it's good or it only gives you an indication of whether an app is good or bad it doesn't give you an indication of whether it's appropriate or not and it doesn't give you it doesn't give you an idea of whether it's rated you know r or 18 or whatever the you know software ratings are it doesn't give you any of that okay but is it just a case that maybe the name was actually just a wrongly named application so if it had been named a proper name it already would have been fine there would have been no kerfuffle about the whole thing yeah if it had been called you know auto image show (laughs) or something like that then yeah probably nobody would have said anything yeah exactly is it a case that sometimes they're a bit too pc that we could just kick up a fuss because of a name that people don't like or associate it with you know it's tricky i I know some people would say oh it's you know political correctness gone mad but actually you know you (laughs) in that voice yeah almost (laughs) certainly but the fact is, we have a very diverse set of users. Mm. It's not just a bunch of blokes down the pub sharing a CD. We've got people in, you know, Muslim countries where they have very different ideals and very different ideas of what is appropriate. And I have a desktop PC that my seven-year-old daughter uses. So, yeah, so there's, there's loads of circumstances where it may be inappropriate. And just giving a presentation at work and point of view pops up. Yeah, it's a bit right. dubious, especially if it's a work machine. Mm. Completely. So then maybe we should look at probably checking and verifying the names of applications that go in. If it looks dubious, then kick into a rating. But Well, but now, then <laughs> uh, what, what right do we have to rename an application? Well, yeah, we could. Yeah, I mean, that's the other option. Is it? It's free software. So, you know, submit a patch that changes it from whatever to Wibble. <laughs> <laughs> to auto image viewer. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, but but then what about the Bible image? ones? Did you change them all to very old book viewer? <laughs> well, I was going to say, say that because even if fiction you... Fiction or non-fiction? <laughs> oh. Even if you had, say, um, like a self-rating thing where the application developer said what it was, well, something like, oh, I don't know, something that wasn't suitable for children, say a game, then it's probably fairly obvious that it's maybe a 15 or an 18 or something. Fairly obvious to whom? To the, to the developer. I mean, they may, it depends whether they comply or not, but there's a point at which you're probably like, yeah, okay, I'd probably say that's an adult content. Mm. So you've got a fair stab at whether they get that right for everybody or not. Mm. But something like the Bible or equivalent books, 
the people it's only going to be offensive to certain people mm. not necessarily by age and I don't know how you do that. And the people who develop, say, a Bible or a similar app are going to want the biggest, or biggest audience they can. And it's not going to be offensive. Yeah. And, and many developers would probably say, I, I don't want to rate my app. You know, because I, per- I personally think this application is appropriate for everyone. The exactly. world should be reading the Bible. You know, the oh. world should be viewing porn or whatever it is that the, the app does. Yeah. Um, Point view doesn't view point necessarily, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and if it's a case that you bring somebody else to review somebody's application, they might take offense at, well, okay, my, my app is suitable for everybody, but according to people who have never met me, don't know me, are now reviewing my app and telling me it's over 15s, you're going to maybe decrease the uh, level of um, applications being put forward for the software center. Well, luckily, um, well, yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Yes, that's true. I mean, we we at the moment we're talking about apps that we've just pulled from Debian, mm-hmm. so that these aren't apps that have been explicitly submitted to the software center. But in the future, we will have more apps that are explicitly submitted to the software center, and those developers, yeah, might might think twice about you know whether they want to submit them. And obviously, we want a diversity. We want people to use the software center. So. Um if we start rating them and telling people what we, 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 do, we don't like and we do like about their application names, then they might not actually um, submit any in the future. Mm. There's a, an industry, a gaming industry standard rating scheme for games that you know, has been for a few years. They can say whether it's 15 or 18 or whatever it is. And it's entirely voluntary and it's based against a, a written standard of, of you know, mm. what is acceptable and what isn't. Um, is there any reason why something like that couldn't work for Ubuntu? I guess one thing could be cultural differences. So I was thinking, like, even at the level of, say, we're, we're happy to talk about 15 and 18s, whereas America is R, and, yeah. you know, there's those differences. Yeah. But then the criteria for each of those was probably very different in certain con- different yeah. countries. Yeah, a recent film, um, uh, what's called The King's Speech, with all the swearing taken out, as I understand it, was rated um, with a higher rating in the US than with all the swearing left in in the UK. <laughs> it was a lower rating. Oh, yeah. So yeah, there are cultural differences, and how do we how do we do that when when you're installing or when you're running the software center? Do we have a set of check boxes that says, you know, perform a census and say, <laughs> I am the following: I am American, I am religious, I I promise I'm over eighteen. Like, yeah, exactly. All of that. You know, how how are you going to be able to convey, or do you, do you default it all on? Do you default the maximum filtration on on day one? And then the user has to go in and switch all this stuff off in order to get access to, you know, all the software. I guess that, sorry. And if you've got multiple users or different Uh, people switching on and off the machine, what do you do then? Do you say the default for the main user? Yeah, because I I could be one user and I could install some software. Yeah. You know, because at the moment, one of the, one of these bugs that we're talking about, um, actually the the user types in a word like unattended and the application that they're, opposed to isn't even installed it's popped up as a prompt to say here's a piece of software that matches your criteria that you might want to install and yes so it's it's not even on the machine (laughs) and 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 it's popping up whereas if i installed that app and you know ubuntu switches that feature off then even if i install it and you use my machine and you search for the word it will pop up for you so yeah it's going to have to be user specific yeah but then maybe some of it comes back to parental controls and maybe just an extension of that so that, as you say, you get it and then you choose what you do and don't want. Yeah, I guess, well, with see, the tricky thing is with parental controls, we had this discussion when I was um, looking at setting up email for my daughter because I, I figured that some sometime she's going to want to email people, although arguably she won't. She'll go on Facebook and then never have an email address. <laughs> you know, nobody will ever email her. That, that aside... Um, I had a lot of comments on my blog from various people saying, you know, you you shouldn't let her near a computer. And then we had people at the other end of the scale saying, what are you doing censoring what what she can see (laughs) online? And I fall somewhere in the middle, you know, kind of... Wet liberal, are you? (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, okay, so if it had been your seven-year-old daughter and she was typing something like it, uh, unattended in for some bizarre reason to the search (laughs) thing, and it came up with... Um, the porn view application, what would your immediate kind of response be? Would, would you think that's inappropriate or I'd would it be- burn the computer? <laughs> <laughs> I would be Install super extreme. Macos. No, I, I would, I don't know. It depends if she asked me, 
Yeah, yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, when you're sat around watching telly and the whole family's watching telly and then some awkward thing comes on the telly. And everyone goes and quiet. And everyone goes quiet. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, the kid goes, Mummy, what are they doing? <laughs> and, you know, it's only if they ask. <laughs> that, yeah. Or you feel the need to educate them on this particular... Oh, now, what you can see here, what's popped up on the screen there? Oh, right, you know, okay. <laughs> are you going to go down that road? You know, when you're watching the film and it's Christmas yeah. Day and it's all awkward. Now, do you see what they're doing now? And then, like, explain it to them. It's, it depends on context, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it will come down to like some games or applications are going to be easily classified and the likes of, say, a Bible or religious areas aren't going to be easily classified. Mm. And there, I guess, you know, people just going to need to respect that and understand that and understand that it cannot be classified. Yeah, we get a lot of uh, respect and uh, in, in people in religious circles respecting yeah. each other's well, points of views, don't we? Well, you know, sometimes people just need to grow up as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's it's interesting for to me that you could actually resolve the the porn view aspect of the problem by just you know changing its name to mm-hmm. Wibble or something, yeah. um, but you can't as easily resolve the uh, religious texts or you know, the inclusion of religious things that some people say and they found offensive and stuff. Even if you would want to be as inclusive inclusive as possible and have all the various different texts in there, that's liable to offend even more people than not having any. In there. <laughs> And even if they're not shipping by default, they're just in a repository online. And then there's even further than that. There's uh, um, software, we've we've discussed this before, that um, uh, some software produces error messages on the screen, which are inappropriate. Oh, yeah, like I remember that. Pulse oh. Audio, for example. If, the, if there's already a copy of Pulse Audio running and you run another copy, there's something that happens on the screen that I can't say. <laughs> and um, I filed a bug about it, and the author just said, stop wasting my time. So... <laughs> Okay, so what we can do is patch that out and say, look, we don't want that kind of message appearing on the screen. In Ubuntu, you mean? In Ubuntu, yeah. I mean, they can carry that upstream. We have to carry that patch all the time. Mm. And then how many... That's just one occasion. How many packages are we going to have to carry patches for to sanitise? We're going to turn into Apple and completely sanitise the whole... Some people would say we already are turning into Apple. Um, (laughs) Sanitise the whole environment and restrict what people can see. And that's surely not what we're about. No, but then we're not just making a product for our own amusement. There is a a commercial element to Ubuntu, and <gasps> no. there it is. I know, <laughs> and you know that they, they want it to be available in as many markets, or, or you know, at least um, you know, not not restricted from being in certain markets as as possible. And you know, I would much rather that you know everybody had access to Ubuntu than you know whole countries decided that they couldn't allow people to to use it. Or it was a problem to use it because there were certain packages installed. But I just have a worry about the freedom of speech aspect, which is that, you know, if somebody wants to make an application centred around a religious text, fine. But there's nothing stopping them doing that. And they can have a personal, you know, PPA thing. Or, yeah. So people can still get it. But I mean, this this came out of that search, didn't it? One of these bugs was yeah. the on like the on screen search, mm-hmm. and one of the solutions was to block out so uh, un- non installed yes. packages, yes. and that kind of solved the problem. Yes, didn't it? It does, but you've you've reduced the functionality. One of the one of the nice things about Unity is, you know, I could type in Chromium, even though Chromium isn't installed by default. I could type in, you know, do me a search for Chromium. Oh, it's not installed, but it is listed on that screen as something I could install. And I just hit the button, and it takes me to the yeah. screen where I installed it. And the, you know, if you if you take that away, you're actually degrading mm. the. The user experience. It's not. It's like not enabling the checkbox on the installer, isn't it? And in fact, not many people have complained about this particular feature. It's not like it's a celebrity. Well, it's kind of a celebrity bug. Now we're talking. It about is, it. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's not like there's a bazillion duplicates of that bug. Yeah. There's just like one guy saying, "Hey, this is probably inappropriate." Maybe we just need to tweak the description for some of those packages so they don't show up quite as readily in searches. Mm. That might solve it. Android yeah. doesn't have this issue, does it? Android on the market. Uh, uh yeah <laughs> yeah there's lots of apps in there that you but there isn't the same contentious not. issue there isn't you know android is everywhere and there isn't the same contentious issue that bugs are being filed for renaming applications no that's a fair point but then where would you file bugs in android well yeah <laughs> <laughs> if you let me know we'll find out <laughs> <laughs> well if you've got any thoughts on that why not email us podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or get in touch with us via all the other mechanisms you can find out at the end of the show. A 
U.S. company has been awarded a contract to develop software for the military that will allow users to create and control multiple online personas in order to spread pro-American propaganda through social media. While critics have likened this to China's attempt to restrict free speech, a spokesman for the military said it's only intended to counter violent extremist propaganda. Yeah, this is a bit weird. Yeah, it is a bit strange. It's it's a bit... All these kind of robotic people cropping up on Facebook saying, I think the current policies of the administration are top hole, yeah. and they are very sensible. <laughs> it does Isn't, sound a bit implausible. Yeah. Isn't this a bit similar to what we already have, internet <laughs> trolls? <laughs> you just go online just to wind people up and say something that's co- pretty much completely contrary to what they really think, just to get a rise out of people. Maybe they'll just employ those people. Oh, you think it's a honey yes. trap? No, it just seems odd. <laughs> just no, odd. I just think we've already got it. I don't think they need to recruit or <laughs> have a whole department for it. We've already got them. They're wackos out there already. <laughs> yes. Microsoft has launched a case against Barnes and Nobles over patent issues with the Android OS used on its Nook ebook reader. Microsoft claims to own patents covering a variety of the user interface features in Android and cites that previous licensing deals with HTC prove these to be valid. Oh dear. Patent Here we go. Wars, the patent wars. Everybody's going to fight in the patent wars. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> That's so tiresome, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> really? Okay. Another yeah. whole heap of legal stuff to... And it, it, none of it gets resolved now. No. Yeah, it'll just like find out in like five years' time that they settled out of court and nobody will ever know the details. Slowing down the pace of progress. Yes. Google have announced the organisations acting as mentors for this year's Summer of Code, in which Google sponsors students to work on open source projects. This year's participants include Moodle, brackets, yay. Close Mark brackets. Mark ah, right. <laughs> Blender, StatusNet, which is the software behind Identica, and pretty much any other open source project or software foundation worth mentioning. Mm. Good old um, Google. Yeah. Mm. Also, Firefox 4 has been released, sporting a host of speed improvements, a refreshed interface, and increased support for new web technologies such as HTML5. Mozilla have also announced that Firefox will be changing to a Chrome-style development model, allowing new features to make it into a stable release much more quickly. They plan to release Firefoxes 5, 6, and 7 by the end of the year. Are they not just all heading for a nervous breakdown? <laughs> <laughs> I presume that Firefoxes 5, 6, and 7 will have not as many new features as the previous major but, yeah. well with Chrome I never noticed like what yeah. what's, nah. and it just suddenly we're on what Chrome 308 you know it's just yeah it's, it's six monthly or something isn't it is it I don't know I just it just updates yeah. on its own and I have no idea but it does it and it, it works yeah and Firefox 4 works as well it's quite nice Cute. I haven't tried it yet the UK government has launched a survey on open standards in order to shape a strategy to make their systems more open, cheaper and better connected. The survey invites users to recommend or warn against adoption of standards for everything from office documents to web services. Ooh, this is exciting. No, it's a really good opportunity to have, a, have mm. some input, I guess, into what uh, public sector and the government could use for software and the supporter could give its use in business. Mm. There you go. <laughs> just like, Laura just, just blown away that. Yeah, she's just astounded by that. Yeah. Google has announced that Honeycomb, the tablet focused version of Android, will not be open source when the first devices ship. The reasons given were that Honeycomb is designed for tablets. It won't transfer well to phones in its current form. Quite why this is a problem when there's already an open source version of Android available for phones isn't clear. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, Honey- honeycomb. Honeycomb is version three, the tablet right, okay, kind right. of looking Android, not the one you've got on that phone. I was thinking of Crunchy Bars. Okay. Yeah. No, they're all named after Sweeties. Aren't okay. They? But yeah, some people have got up in arms about the fact that the whole open source Android and it's not. Okay. Not yet. But it never started out open source, did it? Well, Google have always developed internally and thrown it over the wall to the yeah. open source community. But then, um, you know, they're doing that again. They continue. Fancy that. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Laura CZ, you're going to tell us about an event. I am. A Natty Norwell launch event. You've heard it here first. Thursday, April 28th, the day before the royal wedding. Starting with a slightly different formal event in the BCS. Uh, it may be possibly invitation only, but there will be more information coming up shortly. Um, there's going to be a wild night followed by a pub afterwards, and Alan Bell is looking for suggestions of where to go uh, after the launch party. What, a wild night at the BCS. Well, actually, I think the. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. That's central London. 
Oh, it sounds like fun. Yes. Uh, hopefully the BCS are then, are they giving us food or something? Um, that hasn't been... It hasn't engaged. been finalised just yet. That is just me speculating entirely. <laughs> Put pressure on them, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Go on, BCS. I pay my membership. And that's all the events. Okay, we've got a command line love this time, and it's based around Gwibber. And there's a mm-hmm. tweak in Gwibber that um, Alan's going to tell us about, which is uh, apparently Gwibber is spying on what you say. <laughs> is that, have I read that right? Well, I don't, maybe not spying, but storing. It's uh, storing okay. all of your, um, your tweets and dents in a little database in your home directory, and it, uh, it grows. The reason I found out about this was because I saw a bug get fired by a guy... Uh, I think he's a guy from Turkey, and he follows 17,000 people on Twitter. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> really? and, and he uses Gwibber. Oh, well, well, well. Yeah, I know. And it works? It's ma- yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, those were exactly my reactions when I read the bug report. <laughs> That's wow. kind of extreme social networking. It is, it? yes. But he's using Gwibber, so it's got to be good. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and it works. But the, uh, the problem was that um, after a while it became unbearably slow, and it turns out that one of the reasons why it's unbearably slow is that there's this SQL-like database that stores all the tweets you've ever seen in, in your Gwibber window um, <laughs> back in time. It's pretty useless, really, because if you scroll down the Gwibber window, it's not like you can scroll down to the beginning of time. You only get to see the last, like, 100 tweets or something. Uh. So it's kind of pointless doing it. Um, and there's no automatic clean up on it by there it? isn't yet but uh, i believe ken van dyne who is the maintainer for gwibber in ubuntu is implementing a um a feature to kind of clean that up um but i went the brute force way and <laughs> i've written a little one line script that basically just deletes every tweet and dent and facebook message from inside that database so yeah. it takes my, it took mine mine was 427 meg um it's not insignificant, is it? No. And this guy, this, uh, this guy who follows 17,000 people, his was like one and a half gigabytes of <gasps> SQL-like data. <laughs> and that's Which, like everybody else's tweets and dents. Yeah, everything not you just see. Your own. Uh, yeah. God, if he's generated one and a <laughs> well, half yeah. gig of tweets. <laughs> man. Well, he's got a lot of people to keep in touch with. Well, yeah, yeah. Really. <laughs> a lot of people to uh, retweet, yes. Oh. Um, so all this, li- all this one line does is just delete all of the tweets and dents in the database, and then it does a hoover, a vacuum in the database, and that's it. And the way you do it is you shut down Gwibber, run this command, start Gwibber up, and it's all nice, fresh and clean and tidy and runs better. It's similar to the Firefox trick, the Firefox performance trick, which kind of cleans up the database. Yeah, that was more of just a fact, because I think that does actually internally clear stuff out. Mm. But it, you still get fragmentation in the database. So, and that, that vacuum is supposed to reduce the fragmentation, whereas this line actually just ditches all the data and then <laughs> vacuums so mine went down from 427 meg to nine kilobytes wow yeah that's that's yeah. pretty impressive yeah and did the well that's the, deleting all your data oh yeah, so, sure. yeah just, okay. just in case you're unclear about no, no, it. I, I, the I reason why it. that's impressive is because i have no data nothing. anymore it goes from something to nothing to nothing right <laughs> did it did it improve the performance yes of, right okay of Goiba. yes okay. completely yeah so it'd be worth running this every, I don't know, week or month or something? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It'd be better still if Gwibber did it itself. That, yeah, that'd be good. File a bug. <laughs> Can't argue with that one. Okay, and that's the command line love. Oh, Natty no wall. <laughs> it just it's an odd word. <laughs> Natty narwhal. It's an odd creature. It's, it's easier to say than the next one. What's the creature? A narwhal. A narwhal. It's a whale with a like it's a unicorny Stick. whaley thing with a thing coming out of the nose. A real one animal then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For once it's a real animal, <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'd never seen it until about an hour and a half ago. <laughs> <laughs> Who here's tried it? Yeah. Yes. You spent all week, Laura. Filing bugs. Filing bugs on it. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. And I'm sure over time I will get used to it, but there's some pet peeves in it for me at the moment. <laughs> it royally gets on my... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Alan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounded, what would you say? It's not bad. That really is damning it with faint <laughs> praise. It's not bad, I suppose. You know, it's like changing the whole user interface of the desktop. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's probably why it's, it's not bad. I think that's probably why it's not bad at the present because there's so many little narky little bits. So, like when I go to shut down, 
you automatically go to shut down the system settings for no particular reason just there at the bottom uh, of the menu where you normally see shut, shut, down. shut down and yeah. you go why do I want to hit system settings and um, oh the really annoying pet peeve I have today is that uh, I upgraded to Natty launch Chrome as I usually do and all my passwords are on my settings and oh. every time I click a link in IRC it defaults to Firefox Firefox was never ever my default <laughs> oh ah. <laughs> So yeah, there's a few teething troubles. But, well, and uh, I really, really dislike that. the Ubuntu She's One logo. Now. You don't like the Ubuntu One logo? No, it, it looks odd. like a bit of piece of paper has been ripped outside of it. So it just looks... I know once I talk to somebody, explain that the one is inside the U, but it just looks like a piece of paper has been ripped from right. the side. You don't like that, do you? No, I don't like that. Okay, it's not tidy. No, I understand. <laughs> Tony, have you seen it at all? No, I haven't. I've I've been interested to hear all your views because it is a really it's probably the biggest change I suspect in Apart terms from of the buttons. To the, no, nothing, nothing compared, compared to this. this. <laughs> um, probably the biggest change in the Ubuntu interface since it started. Certainly the biggest change yeah. between one release and the next. Well, every every release has had has uh, a bar at the top and the bottom. Yeah, and clock in the top right and your menu, menu the top places left. system. Yeah, that's that's been there yeah. for four or five years or more, and no more. Mm. Because it's going away. Well, not completely. Because the the thing about Natty is that um, when you log on, when you get the log on screen, you can actually choose. And um, by default, you'll get the the new Unity interface. But also uh, on the okay. desk is the old two panel GNOME setup. So you can log into the old setup if you prefer that. Okay, so that's good. So if people really struggle, they can go. They can go back. Yes. But given that a lot of people like to use the default because it's the default. The default. Mm -hmm. um, how are people found... Sorry, Laura's laptop's making a huge racket over there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Nothing to yeah. do with Natty. <laughs> <laughs> you say no, that. No, it is just... Uh, no. Remember that Mandrake release that managed to kill CD drives and so maybe we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Natty kills laptops. Um, yeah, so you've got the, the menu bar down the left-hand side as the part of Unity. Launcher. The yes. launcher. There's lots of new terminology coming in. Yes, okay. The launcher down the left-hand side. Yes. Which is the thing that makes all the thing with lots of buttons that, that people swell. traditionally calls, call a dock. Like okay. what Mac has across the bottom. Yes, but on the side. So but it's on the left-hand side. Legally side. different. Yes, because <laughs> it's along the side. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it's not, yeah. And it's not movable. It's vertical, not horizontal. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's so that's the launcher. Okay. And there's buttons down there for the stuff that you use regularly. The well, Now, do the you stuff choose you put, those? Well, there's some pre-filled, like Firefox, Tomboy, and right. stuff like that. But yeah, you can pin stuff to that. Okay. So if you've got an app open, you can say, oh, I use this all the time. And you can right-click it and say, keep it there. And then it'll always be there on the right, on the left-hand side for you. Okay. And that serves as a launcher then. If the app's not running, it will launch it. If yep. it's running, it brings it up. It yeah, that's the other that's the other difference. It shows in that panel what's running, then you get a little tiny kind of Triangle. arrowhead notch yeah. thing at the side of it and if right. you've got multiple windows of it open you get multiple notches on the side. Okay. So it's a bit like a status bar, not a yeah, the bottom. Dock. So <laughs> okay, so uh, what have people been saying about that is it, yeah. Well, it's different. Yeah, and that, that's the key thing. That's a big change, isn't it's it? A big, it's a big change. And a lot of people don't like it because it's a big change. Some people, very early on, before any code had been released for this natty, um, said, I don't like it, it's rubbish. And that was based on the Unity interface that was in the last release, 1010. Right. And that was a completely different code base. Right. Uh, it had similar features like, you know, a, a launcher down the side and all that kind of stuff, but it was very different. This this version is implemented as a plugin for Compiz. Right. So you have a composited desktop, a three D composited desktop to do the like zooming in and out and all the all the like groovy stuff. And Unity is a plugin for that. So if people tried it in the last release, didn't like it very much, they should really give it a, a go on Natty. Yeah, why not? Because it's yeah, because it's significantly different. Yeah. I, I wouldn't dismiss it based on the experience that people have had in 10.10. And the other thing we've got is something called the BFB, which it says in my notes stands for Big Freaking Button. Yeah, it's an affectionate name for the Ubuntu logo in the top left-hand corner. Okay. You know, you know how there's some, other, there's some other operating system that has a logo in the top left-hand corner? Yeah, fruit-based thing. Yeah, yep. the fruit-based thing uh, in the top left-hand corner. It's like that. Yeah, yeah. it's like that. Okay, and it, and it, that does what? Uh, it lets you, you get to it. applications and uh, files, and it's basically how you get to everything from okay. there. Okay. 
So anything that's not listed in the launcher on the left hand side, and also some stuff that is, you just hit that button. So it's right. like it's like the how do I get to anything? That button. It's like the button the on your button. netbook release, isn't it? Only that's smaller then. Oh, that's that's a fair point. That's a very good point. Yeah. I'll, I'll get it. Uh, I've got Easy Peasy running on my netbook, uh-huh. and that has a little picture of a lemon. Right. Yes. It's easy squeezy lemon pe- oh, yeah. <laughs> Um And that sort of shows me the desktop and minimizes all the applications and hides them. Right. That I, this running. just does a, an overlay thing on the top, which you, pe- they were, used to be called places, but I think they're now called lenses. That's called which a lens. Okay. It's just the whole new naming thing as well. It's just it's, like, seriously, who came up with lenses? <laughs> but who's going <laughs> to use it as well? Because it's not like it's labeled on screen. No, How do you mean it, who's going to use it? How who's well, going to refer to it? Who's a new user going to call it a lens? Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've been using it for weeks, and I had no idea what it was called. Doesn't really matter, does that? Uh, well, does if you're talking no, to somebody, if you're giving a bug report, that's true. Yeah. Or uh, talking about it, they all refer to things as lenses. I'm like, seriously, what are you talking about? <sighs> that's true. Yeah, but also from a user point of view, you know, if I was trying to explain to my mum. Open you the know, lens. Open the lens. Like, what? You know the big black splodge on the screen, that thing. She's yeah. there trying to put her contacts back in. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alan, you said earlier when you were giving me a tour um, <laughs> that there's a whole new philosophy around. Well, I, I'm not sure it's a philosophy or more of a um, an idea that you don't have loads of windows overlapping all over the place mm. and that everything should be full screen. Yeah. Because... The, there's two reasons for that. One, it focuses your attention. And, and secondly, you get the maximum desktop real estate. Mm-hmm. So for, for a, a laptop, like my laptop is a 1280 by 800, 800 vertically. And I've got almost all of that 800 vertical for whatever app because there's only one panel across the top. Yeah. I don't, it's not uh, like the old one where I had a panel on the bottom. And even Firefox in this version doesn't have a status bar. And lots of the app developers have trimmed down their, the, the, the Chrome that goes around their app. Mm. So there's, there's less stuff on the screen to take away from the content. So didn't PC computing really take off when Windows 3.1 came out and you could start moving lots of screen, <laughs> windows around the screen? Yeah. And have loads of overlapping stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. But you, you can still you can have workspaces, can't you? So mm-hmm. you can have a workspace with one application or set of applications. If you're a developer, maybe you've got like a terminal and a couple of editors. Yeah, or something Mark, like Mark was saying he, he has everything full screen on a separate desktop. Yeah, and then switches between it, depending if he's looking at his email, development, yeah. Yeah. web, or whatever's going on. I, guess. Yeah. I, I used to do that as well. And in fact, I don't know why... Why I'd, Oh, I know why, because Compiz was a bit unreliable for the last couple of releases, that's why. <laughs> no, I do that. I, like, I leave one desktop for my Quiver, one desktop for IRC, and it'll cheap between mail and actually proper work. Yeah. It means like, I don't always have to look at Quiver, which is good. I don't always have to look at IRC, which means I can actually look at my work desktop. And I guess having the notifications means you can leave your email on a different workspace over, you know, over there, gesturing somewhere over there, and Quiver on another one. And, you know, whatever other applications that might give yeah. you notifications, yeah. like Instant Messenger. And you just get the little pop-up. And then when you need to, you can switch Flick the desktop and, and forth. Yeah, no, it, it does work out pretty well. It is not bad. It just will take getting some used to. I had to boot into the GNOME desktop the last day to use a print screen because my print screen stopped working because it doesn't focus properly. So there are some little pet peeves, which if they were ironed out, it would be nice. But at present, they're not fully ironed out. Yeah, there's still, there's still plenty of bugs in it. I mean, I, I, <laughs> last night, I think I filed four. Um, Launchpad must really love you right now. In one go. And, and some of them, over the last 24 hours, have been um, duplicates, duplicated. So they're, they're, they're bugs that they already knew about. So there's well, plenty of It also means that there's more and more yeah. people testing it as well, which is good because that means we more have a more stable release. So the likes of Ubuntu yeah. Global Jam coming up, if more and more people are testing Natty, then we'll have more feedback and get all these bugs ironed out now. Mm. So it's a good opportunity to give it a go, file some bugs if you find them, and then hopefully the Global Jam will... Now's probably the best time to do it. It's a, it's a lot more stable now. I mean, I still get, like, while we've been recording, Gwibber, uh, not Gwibber, Compiz has crashed twice. Yeah. But it's not, <laughs> it's not crashed in such a catastrophic way that I've lost anything. It's just all the windows get thrown around the screen for a, for a few seconds, and then it all comes back. Right. So we've got a month left until release. Yeah, I was going to say, because it's not that long to go, really, is it? Because yes. it's four, uh, going to be 11.04, mm. and it's 11.03 now, <laughs> yes. and Ubuntu, for another two days. <laughs> and Ubuntu Global Jam is on this weekend, so there's a lot of people around the world taking part in the event, and hopefully taking part in doing bugs and logging them and testing it, so we'll get mm. a lot of feedback. 
Well, one of the people who's listening live to us um, and commenting in hash Ubuntu dash podcast dash I got that wrong, didn't I? Hash yeah. Ubuntu dash UK dash podcast in the Freenode IRC channel is Tom Bragg, who says that he's uh, unhappy. Basically, there's still no way to launch another instance of an application from the launcher. Yeah, there is. We've already got one running, uh, and Alan is now going to school Tom in how to do so. <laughs> Listen here, Tom. Um, what you have to do is middle click. Uh, That's you, uh, just obvious. Yeah, duh. I um, couldn't even find the middle click button on your mouse. It's the big one in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, if you if you imagine you've got this launcher down the left hand side. If you single left click on an icon and that application's not already open, it will open that that application. If you click it again, it just switches to that application. If you um, right click, a little menu appears that lets you. Um, keep that in the launcher but if you middle click it opens another instance of whatever that app is so if you want a a second firefox window or something you middle click it and you get a new one it'd be useful if the right click included an option to say open another window or something yeah like people used to right click like like open new tab in a browser does i think they're really trying to trim these down i mean you can't there you can't even right click properties one of these so for example the firefox um one i like to have some command line parameters on my firefox to um tell it to pop up a dialogue and ask me which profile i want to use and i know mark uses that feature a a lot Mm -hmm. as well because a web developer has lots of firefox profiles um but you can't actually maintain those and i filed a bug about it saying there's no way for me to right click properties and Mark replied, no, we don't want that. Um, we don't, <laughs> basically, we don't want Not that. Not our Mark. No, Mark Shuttleworth <laughs> replied, no, we don't want that. Um, and so the only way to maintain that is editing a .desktop file somewhere. Which I'm sure is that's not nasty. good enough for end users. Well, uh, the argument is, how often would you edit the command line for any of these applications? If in you're the an end user, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. end users are web developers as well. Yeah, and web developers can do these things. So you're really kind and they're of... not necessarily Linux admins. No, true. Yeah. So you're really kind of telling your users what way you want them to do things from now on, which I don't yeah. really think is good enough to tell them that they can't do it anymore. Well, that's always been a kind of no way of doing yeah. things. <laughs> is, we'll remove this button. You don't need that. Well, one of the uh, comments I had, I was talking to Laura's mum um, earlier in the week, and she has been using Ubuntu, the uh, Maverick, Ubuntu, Ubuntu desktop as was, mm-hmm. um, and had been trying out Unity. Now, I'm not 100% sure whether she was trying out Natty or whether she was trying out the, the version It was, was in. Maverick, because I don't think it looks quite the same. This is right. right. Yeah. Okay. It's changed a lot. But she said she found it very difficult to sort of move from one to the other. She was, she found the uh, GNOME default GNOME desktop quite intuitive to use. She was easy enough for her to find what she wanted to do, get on with stuff. But the change into Unity was a bit disconcerting. I, I'm quite looking forward to giving um, this to my mum because I go around there and I see twenty copies of Chrome running down on at the bottom of the screen, <laughs> okay. and I think. That one thing that she's got 20 copies of Chrome would eradic- be eradicated by this because when she clicks on the button for Chrome, it would switch to Chrome. It wouldn't open a new one. So is, that, is, is she going to have to learn to use tabs rather than just starting another instance of Oh, Chrome? she already has tabs. Okay. She already does do tabs. So she's got 20 instances of Chrome, each with a dozen tabs in. Yeah. So she's wow. doing what you do in, in Unity where you just click it and it brings it back rather than starting it afresh. Yeah, at the moment she's yeah. starting okay. a new one each time and you don't really want that. Yeah, well, my, my mum uses um, Windows 7 a lot. She's got a, this is just on a netbook, the Ubuntu. So she's used to Windows 7 and is quite happy with that. Mm. There so. are some similarities between this and Windows 7. Uh, okay, yeah. fair enough. Apparently there are some people complaining that it's difficult to middle click on a laptop without. It is really good. I just, I just tried this second. I can't middle click. I don't know how to. You've got a ThinkPad. You've got a middle button right there. Oh yeah. Oh, in between the other two buttons, that yeah, third really one don't like in this the middle. Pad. <laughs> <laughs> and on some laptops, it's actually three fingers does a middle click. Okay. So two yep. does a right and three does middle. Well, while Laura is trying to work that out and is shaking her fist at her laptop, um, if you've got any swearing, absolutely. If you've got any thoughts about uh, Natty or the uh, new Unity interface in general, um, please send them in podcast at ubuntu uk dot org or all the normal places.
It's time for the bit about Ubuntu ecosphere, Gerald. Hey! Bit about Ubuntu. Yeah. Um, and the first one, uh, we mentioned last time that um, a bug had been filed asking for the tick box on the installer to be default on. Yes. To do MP3 and, and all that kind of stuff. And all the yeah. stuff, yeah. And the Ubuntu technical board had um, a meeting this week and unanimously decided against implementing that change. Aha, uh-huh. so that means it's not going to be on by default. That's right. It's still not be there in, in, this release, in this release. It's not going to be ticked by default. The option will still be there, so a user can still tick it to you know install Flash and MP3 stuff, but not by default. And uh, everybody's favourite bearded community wrangler, John O'Bacon's made a blog post in which he sort of talks about that. And yeah, he's trying to a bit. Suge- uh, well, he's trying to solicit um, uh, suggestions for how we can improve that 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 process whether we should do it differently and you know people have come up with mock-ups of a slider and you know how we i, w- I was thinking personally of a great big dial to that goes from zero to eleven free to, to evil free to evil <laughs> yeah 11, 11 is maximum evil you could get like a little illustration that morphed if, from a from a sort of an angelic face yeah no from richard stallman to mark shuttleworth <laughs> <laughs> or steve jobs yes Okay, that sounds like a sensible plan <laughs> <laughs> for a happier future. Um, there's been a new Creative Commons licensed Ubuntu web comic launched called Ubuntu Bytes, which you can find at ubuntubytescomic.blogspot.com. Yes. I think it got up to episode five so far, which is pretty yes. good going. It's, um, that's made by um, someone who just recently got their Ubuntu membership um, at one of the recent um, membership board, board meetings. Things. Yeah. Uh, someone who also runs a website called I Heart Ubuntu. Oh, well, it's good. You know, it's another good thing that people can contribute that isn't, you know, development, isn't coding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, absolutely. You know, Advocacy comics. and yeah. uh, amusement. But um, <laughs> is it funny? <laughs> I, I've only seen the first couple. I've just seen the fact they've got to number five on this browser and I can't see it from here. Um, oh. I'm sure it's very good. <laughs> That's not what you said before we started recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's harsh, Laura. <laughs> the... Dex project has been launched aimed at getting developments from Debian derivatives, including Ubuntu, into the upstream distro. The Ubuntu team can be found in hash Ubuntu-Debian on IRC. Mm. Good bit of collaboration there. Mm. Is this something that um, the community team are working with, Jono and George and Daniel? Um, I think it's more of a... Daniel. Uh, um, uh, I think Matt Zimmerman and um, Stefano... Uh, uh, the name. DPL? Yeah, the DPL. The Debian ah. project lead uh, works out, yes. And oh, okay. I believe there's going to be other groups uh, building on this, other downstreams from Debian going to um, use this as well. All the ones that are no longer downstreams of Ubuntu. <laughs> that are now, yeah. <laughs> now downstreams of Debian. Gave up on us and Crunch switched Bang to and Debian. Mint yes. and all, that sort of stuff. all of those, yes. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, the colour palette for the console has been modified to make it easier on the eyes. The screen of death blue that used to be the background in a text mode installer will now be aubergine. Yes. Ooh. I like the way Ubuntu people no longer say purple. <laughs> Aubergine. <laughs> so, how is that easier on the eyes? It's not easier to say. That blue. Is <laughs> <laughs> the blue just smacks of DOS. Yeah. It, it, it like or I Windows. think in um, Dustin Kirkland, who's the guy who's driving this yeah. uh, this change, who likes to pretty up consoles, is the same guy who did Boyobu, the yes. thing down the bottom. Um, yeah, he said, you know, it smacks of MS-DOS and Windows 3.1 installer, which is like a blue DOS screen. Yeah, and I remember it well. Yeah, it looks like that. So okay. now we've got this nice purple. And it does look quite nice, but... Is it, is it still going to be a, a light font white or something on, on top of the aubergine? Well, it's the, you know, the, the um, alternate installer where you've got like mm. a, a red screen in the middle with the white buttons and then behind that yeah. is all blue. That's all now aubergine. Okay, so the, the red bit is still red. Yeah. Okay, I think. Yeah. So red on aubergine? Red on aubergine. Uh. Or is it? I can't remember. Maybe, well, oh, I don't know. Try it. Oh. Well, you know, in a few years' time, we'll switch back to the blue because it's retro. Yes. You see, I've never had a particular problem with it because it's the server release. It's going to be server people who are probably going to install it who... Don't, you know. don't care about colour? <sighs> are probably using a KVM that's black and white only? Maybe. Yeah, yes. yeah you know. Who, and you see it for, I don't know, 20 minutes while you do an install. Have no taste, probably wear glasses, are in a darkened room, all these kind of stereotypes. Tom is a <laughs> server person doesn't wear glasses. This is very true. true. Yeah. I'm the only one in my team of eight who doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they work harder. <laughs> oh, oh harsh. harsh. Yeah. Okay, what's next? Moving on rapidly. <laughs> 
Oh, that would be me. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, the Ubuntu Technical Board also, uh, since we last recorded, have uh, been looking to improve responses to questions from the user community on the Ubuntu Brainstorm website. So they've, they've identified a whole bunch of questions which seem to be pretty common fundamental questions and um, they've uh, sent messages out to developers who work in those particular areas and asked the developers, actually you know, forcibly told the developers, please go to Brainstorm and right. answer this question as fully as you possibly can. Okay. Because well, at, at the moment, it seems to be the brainstorm is mostly a bunch of community people all arguing about what the best way to do something is, and not necessarily the developers arriving and saying, hang on a minute, that's not a good idea, or we can't do that for this reason, or we could do that for whatever reason. Are things from brainstorm still regularly harvested and taken note of? Define regularly. <laughs> Ever? Uh, probably about once every six months. Okay. And they look. Coinciding at- with the UDS. Right, so they look at the top suggestions and then maybe say, oh, maybe we do this one, maybe we won't do that one. Yeah, but- I think with the likes of the technical board now doing this as well, it means that actually more and more brainstorm ideas may possibly get it recognition. But on top of that, it also would answer people. They finally get an answer to their question, which is good. Yeah. And I am really am impressed with the technical board, the way they are doing stuff at the moment. They're one of the really good councils I'm well impressed with. Yeah, and we talked earlier about them turning down the freedom, I was hating software option. But at least they're answering and they're, and they're, they're taking and... part in the community, they're listening to people. Yeah. And, you know, that's a hard decision. It's been blogged about and tweeted about and dented about, but they're there, they're willing to take questions and answers, and that's pretty good. So can you remind us who sits on the technical board? Is it not community people then? Oh. I, I don't expect a categorical list, but is it mostly canonical employees? It is. Right. Col- okay. um, Colin... Mark, Mark Shuttleworth, Colin Watson, Keybook. Got. James Remnant. Which isn't canonical anymore. True. Martin. Pitt. Pitt. Oh, Christ. Okay. And but, that's about as many as I can remember. So, mainly canonical people. Yes. So it's, but uh, not completely. But not, not completely. completely. So, there's a little bit of. Yeah, now, now Scott left them on. <laughs> <laughs> not completely, yes. Excellent. Okay, well, that's it's good to see them, you know. Yeah. And there's a whole load of these uh, These gone out, been sent out. So, that's yeah, good to see. Okay. And then on to the not a bad Ubuntu. Yes. Okay, what's in the. Not a bad Ubuntu this time. Um, OpenSUSE are looking at changing their... Um, we talked about release names and how you know everyone seems to be on the release name bandwagon at the moment. Yeah, and we got lots of people telling us that Fedora, Fedora's beefy miracle was nothing to do with Ubuntu and their silly naming conventions. Yes. In fact, we had the beefy miracle himself. Yes, on Twitter. Uh, leave a comment on our, um, on our oh, post right. last yeah, time, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't see what this has got to do with Ubuntu. Yes. Mr. Miracle. Yes, Mr. B. Miracle. Anyway, <laughs> OpenSUSE... <laughs> Uh, carrying on the trend of uh, changing release names and numbers, they want to um, relook at how they number uh, their releases. So um, there's a discussion and a bit about how they number their systems to make it easier to understand. And they've documented how every other distro numbers there so they can pick which one they choose. Which really? one they think is best, yeah. I think that's a really, that's a, that's a really well planned. It's thorough. Thing. It's very it's really thorough. thorough and comprehensive yeah. review. Mm. Ubuntu style, Ubuntu style variation, Mandriva style. I didn't Fedora even know style. there was an Ubuntu style variation. Well, the, I think they're, they're proposing the variation. Uh, but, sorry, yeah. the, well, the Ubuntu one is yy.mm, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The variation they're proposing is to use all four digits of the year and then a dash instead of a dot between the... Wow, golly. Yeah. Hold then, the front then, page. Um, if you can contain your excitement, um, check out the web page. There'll be a link in the show notes. There's also another thing in the Not About Ubuntu, which is um, Chris Gutteridge from Yay. Sotech. Um, we all went to, I say we all, um, two yeah. of us, went to <laughs> the uh, bar camp that Chris and another man called Chris, Chris. helped run at uh, in Southampton. And he's been linked to in the Register article about... Uh, wow. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, about his day job, which is at Southampton University, which is about the semantic web and, you know, mm. data and the Tim Berners-Lee thing about... Yeah, you know, the uh, the web should be two directional, not one directional. Read, write, and work out its logic about who's related to what and all that sort of stuff. Scary. Um, sounds yeah. like Facebook. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> no, it sounds like diaspora. I think you mean. Sorry. It's, it's quite quite explicitly not like Facebook because one of the things that Tim Berners Lee says in this article is about you know Facebook is a closed, it's walled garden. You can only uh, put data in; you can't take your data out ooh. as much. Whereas the semantic web would allow you to keep your data wherever you wanted to keep it and own your own data but still link it with all the other pools of data that are on the web that is the limit of my knowledge about the web (laughs) the interesting thing i read on wikipedia the other day is that um the facebook guy mark zuckerberg actually donated a whole pile of money to diaspora 
because he thinks it's a really cool idea. Yes. He's got enough to spare. <laughs> yeah, I know. But still. Well, okay, yeah, good on him. There you go. Next up. Alan, I have no idea oh, what this okay. is. You haven't no, read it up. Neither have I. <laughs> I have no idea what this is either. And it's one of those ones where it does not say what it is in the URL. Oh, sorry. Uh, Red Hat reported their fourth quarter fiscal year 2011 results, and they seem quite good. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Profits are up for yes. Red Hat. Yes. Excellent. Well done. Go yeah. Red Hat. Well done, Red Hat. Keep, yeah. keep. This is good. Keep, this yeah. is fantastic because if Red Hat do well, they carry on employing open source developers who develop stuff, and yeah. we take it and package it up for Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. Well done, Red Hat. Ralph Green left us a voicemail about having the installer checkbox selected by default. Hello, this is Ralph with the Dallas Fort Worth Unix Users Group. Um, I enjoyed your last show. I want to say in concerns um, Ubuntu bug 723.831. I sure hope they leave the checkbox off so that they don't encourage more people to have insecure buggy systems. Flash is just too bad to be installed by default. If somebody uh, has so little concern about security and, and their system that they want to install it, I guess that's their decision. But I certainly wouldn't want to uh, have, encourage more people to install it by default. Um, the last little comment is, is I finally figured out from listening to this show why you don't have more women on the show. You require them to be named Laura before you let them come on as a guest. Oh, well. Looking forward to the next show. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Thank it you. It is a pretty real question. Yeah. It yeah. seems to be the case. Absolutely. Uh, you can read more about the listener perspectives on, their, on, on our website at podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Chris Blow emailed us to wonder. Is Mark planning on attending this year's UK Moodle Moot? And if so, is he doing a talk? I shall be attending for the first time. Congratulations, Mark. You've got a, fan, a stalker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Mark actually isn't going to be there this year. Oh, what a shame. But he says he might submit a paper next for next year. year. Yeah, so maybe next year. Yeah, you have to stalk him down there. Uh, Kubuntu <laughs> emailed to say... What perfect timing, and what better way to celebrate St. Patrick's Day than to listen to the latest Ubuntu UK podcast with guest host Laura C. Z. <laughs> Z, Z <laughs> tab. You should make this an annual event. What a great idea. That's Every great, St. Patrick's yeah. Day we'll get you over. Oh, and, uh, get me over? Yeah, I'm over, over here now. Over here. She's in. No, I meant over to this house. Oh, right. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Even Sorry, studio. Studio. sending me back. Studio. <laughs> studio. 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 Keep up the illusion. <laughs> to the podcasting caravan. <laughs> Ken Fallon emailed to add to our segments about RMS and public speaking. I got to see RMS speak in the University Auditorium in Eindhoven during the European tour. There his style presentation and much his publicised habit of challenging the questions made sense. I think he is simply a somewhat eccentric professor who is on a mission to challenge his students to think. That form of interaction doesn't translate well to other forms and Ed Moglan is a far better orator for these places. Uh, even shares the same views as RMS but manages to convey the messages with eloquence and passion. Fair point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't get um, uh, 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 feedback with such a strength of feeling as I was expecting following the uh, the, the, the following the RMS troll we well, did in the last episode. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't deliberate a troll or anything, no. but I was I was sort of expecting um, yeah some people with sort of really pro RMS views maybe to they kind wouldn't of, be listening to this show. Well, possibly because we not. put it out in MP3 we, format. We do it in we? Og as well. I know. Hmm. We're very clever yeah. about these things. It takes us hours. <clears throat> Andy Piper emailed to comment. I'm unsure whether I'm surprised about the limited airplay you gave to the Canoe Gnome App Indicator Gate saga. It's been a big deal in the developer community, if not the user one, and it's really tough for me to stick with Canonical through the whole thing. That's mostly with my developer and community hat on, though, rather than as a user. Interesting stuff, anyway. Um, remind us what the Canoe Gnome App Indicator Gate saga is. Um, it's the whole does Canonical um, contribute to Gnome and... Um how what was the process that went around the contribution of specific parts like the indicator um applet okay and the reason one of the reasons why we chose not to do it is because everyone else seems to have a much better recall of all of this <laughs> and it's all very painfully well documented in other people's <laughs> blogs i don't think we could do it justice i really yeah fair enough yeah. to be fair well he's going to comment on those blog posts then uh, andy yes 
Chris left a comment on our website to ask... Where does the music come from that you use? It is quite catchy and I need to know now. Can you please bring back the FAQ back on the website, which actually details this? Because every <laughs> week, at least, some point asks on IRC. Oh, did it? Oh. I don't remember. Did we have an did FAQ? Have FAQ? <laughs> Golly. I don't remember that. Oh, oh well, okay. Uh, it's called? It's called Crazy Words, Crazy Tune. Um, the version we have is by the Savoy Orphans Band, which I think was released in about 1929. So um, out of copyright. So <laughs> nicely out of copyright. Um, and there are several other versions around as well mm. that you can get your hands on if you if you try yeah. hard enough. That's what it's called. And the music that you play while we're on hold is the oh, same yes. album? If you're listening to the live stream, um, the music you hear before or after the show is uh, a similar album. I'm not quite sure it's the same album. Mm. But there we go. And finally, the Wing Commander, who you might remember from our previous episodes, um, has sent us some more feedback. Wing Commander, Sir Arthur Curmudgeon here. I was most gratified to receive a copy of your excellent podcast, Thingamajig, via my nephew's Walkman. But I must say I'm disappointed not to be able to play it on the wind-up gramophone. I even woke up at one point when the chap in the control tower paused to say he was wrestling with a cat. This put me in mind of an incident some years ago when Binky Carstairs and I were foraging in the bush in Kenya when we were suddenly attacked by a tiger. Came as something as a surprise as tigers aren't native to Kenya. So there we were wrestling with the big cat. Binky concluded that tickling it behind the ears wasn't going to work since it had already ripped one of his legs off. I came up with a novel solution to subdue the beast. I shot it. Unfortunately, the bullet went through the tiger and into Binky Carstairs. Sorry to say, neither the tiger nor Binky were ever the same again. I was going to advise your young chap not to allow cats into the control tower, but my great-nephew decided he was probably wrestling with a particularly complex cat command. In which case, he should try the less command, which allows you to scroll up and down a listed file by lines and pages. Mm, I think I just had one of my funny turns again. Nurse? Nurse? Anyway, jolly good show. Keep up the good work. And if anyone fences a stuffed tiger to go over the fireplace, look me up on eBay. Yours, the WC. <laughs> okay, it's bonkers. That was <laughs> raving bonkers. That was entertaining. Literally uh, over a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never have again. <laughs> How bizarre! Ooh. That was probably one of the best feedbacks I think we've ever had. I do like to see <laughs> oh dear, really? Yeah. <laughs> is that what it, it made me laugh. That's like it a challenge for him to send one the next time. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I hope we'll have go a for it, Wing Commander. Yeah, absolutely. If you can spare some time from flying planes. And finally, finally, Matt Daubney from the Ubuntu UK Loco has posted a message asking for feedback on uh, the naming and role of the team leaders or points of contact within the Ubuntu community. Um, he started a whole discussion thread on uh, the mailing list and we'll put a link in the show notes. Excellent. And that's all your feedback this time. <laughs> There we go. That's all for this episode. Although Mark, in his absence, has left us a special message asking for as many people as possible to go to this following URL, uh, which is tinyurl.com slash uupcfortunes. And what you'll find there is a little survey. And what he's going to do is in the next episode, when uh, the four regulars, if you like, are back together, he's going to have another episode of the quiz, and he's going to be the quiz master, and he's going to do family fortunes, but legally different, so UUPC fortunes. So right. This is his case of gathering his data. It's all about Ubuntu and free So this is his survey of 100 people. Yes. Right. Although, you know, give or take a few. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to scale it up a bit. Or maybe scale down. Um, the, uh, yeah, so go along there, tinyurl.com slash UUPC fortunes, and um, you can answer the survey and find out. Uh, as, and help contribute to the embarrassment that will undoubtedly come our way <laughs> in the next episode. 
So, um, but that is all for this episode. So thank you for listening and downloading and thank you for listening live if you're doing so. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, uh, Facebook and IRC channels. Uh, let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. And you can join us um, on Tuesday the 12th of April for our next live episode. Half past and, eight, UTC. And thanks, Laura, for Be coming home. down. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Uh, both of you. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, thank you both for being here. And thank you to Alan Bell for doing sterling work pasting the links yeah. from oh, our show yeah. notes into the IRC channel. You've yes, done a great job, you, sir. Thank you. So join us again in two weeks, 1930 UTC, eight, uh, 2030 British Summertime. Bye-bye. Bye bye.